brain on time and statements and questions in this hearing today because, as I said, there's a lot of interest in this oversight hearing. This hearing today is entitled GM and Chrysler Dealership Closures and Restructuring. The chairman, ranking member, and the chairman emeritus will be recognized for a five-minute opening statement. Other members of the subcommittee will be recognized for three-minute opening statements. I will begin. For much of the past 100 years, General Motors has been the largest automobile company in the world. The Detroit Three, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, have fueled the engine of Michigan's economy as well as the economy of the United States for generations. Through their vehicle manufacturing, countless suppliers, and a vast dealer network, the automotive industry has created and supported millions of jobs. With the recent global financial collapse, much of the domestic auto industry has been brought to its knees. In 2008, General Motors and Chrysler lost $30.9 billion and $17 billion, respectively. And in order to survive, they both filed for bankruptcy. In the bankruptcy process, General Motors has announced plans to close roughly 1,200 dealerships, and Chrysler announced plans to close 789 dealerships nationwide. The federal government has loaned billions of dollars to GM and Chrysler in an effort to help stabilize them. Billions of more have been committed to assist them while emerging from bankruptcy. Today's hearing will focus on several issues asso associated with General Motors and Chrysler's decisions to close more than 2,000 dealerships across the country. Among the questions to be answered are, why do the manufacturers believe they need to close so many dealerships? What criteria were used to determine which dealerships to close? How do GM and Chrysler save money by closing these dealerships which are independently owned. Why were Chrysler dealers given a mere 26 days notice in their French 26 days notice that their franchise would be pulled? Why were dealerships that had been meeting or exceeding their expected sale requirements still ordered to close? Why did Chrysler effectively order dealers to buy more cars in January but now refuse to buy those cars back from dealers who are being forced to close? Who made decisions of which dealerships to close? What are GM and Chrysler doing to assist dealerships with selling their parts, cars, and tools, specialty tools, before they're put out of business? How will the dealerships closures and restructuring make GM and Chrysler more competitive and profitable? Being from Michigan, I absolutely want to see General Motors and Chrysler survive. I think we all do. But we have an old saying in Michigan that when the auto industry sneezes, Michigan catches a cold. Now, due to the global financial collapse, the entire nation is feeling the impact of a crippled domestic auto industry. Other than high gas crisis or a serious food outbreak, I can't think of few subjects that have brought the ire of so many members as these auto dealership closures. I understand the fact that General Motors and Chrysler need to improve their bottom line. I also understand that the import brands have far fewer dealerships with higher sales volume per dealership. What many of my colleagues and I do not fully understand is why there is a need to close so many dealerships and why dealerships that appear to be forming well are now being told to close their doors. We will hear from Chrysler today that the average Chrysler dealer sold 405 vehicles and lost $3,431 in 2008. We will also hear from Dan Kikanap of Tacoma Dodge in Tacoma, Washington. Tacoma Dodge had net sales exceeding $1.7 million last year and was one of the top 100 dealers for sales of parts in 2008 and was the number one ranked Dodge dealer in western Washington during the month of April this year, but still received a closure notice from Chrysler. I look forward to asking Mr. Press how he reconciles this decision to close Tacoma Dodge. As I mentioned earlier, I want to see GM and Chrysler return to strong and vibrant companies. I am, however, concerned that the accelerated time frame for dealership closures and the way in which dealers have been treated may actually damage the brands more than help them. I'm also deeply concerned that the closures will hurt rural communities disproportionately. In my vast rural northern Michigan district, if a dealer closes down, it can mean a two-hour drive for us to reach the next closest dealer. This will cause added expense and hardship for my constituents who need to have, a, who need to have warranty work or special service done at a certified dealership. In addition, when it comes to time to purchase a new vehicle, 
Many of my constituents will abandon GM or Chrysler and go to whichever brand is locally sold by people they trust within our communities rather than traveling a long distance to huge, impersonal, big box dealerships where they don't know the sales or the service staff. In closing, I want to thank General Motors and Chrysler executives for coming here today. This committee understands how busy you are and greatly appreciate you taking time to work with our staff and attend today's hearing. In addition, I want to thank the dealers who have come from every region of the country to testify today. I know that in many instances, many of you are facing the loss of your livelihood and to take the time and expense to travel to Washington to have be part of this hearing is appreciated by myself, the staff, and everyone here. Next, I'd turn to the ranking member, Mr. Walden Morgan, for an opening statement, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I want to thank you and Chairman Waxman for concurring with me in the need for our subcommittee to uh, conduct an oversight hearing and investigation to get answers regarding the termination of auto dealer franchises all across our country. I want to recognize the dealers, including a constituent of Oregon's 2nd District, which I represent, Bob Thomas of Thomas Chevrolet Cadillac in Bend, Oregon. Bob and the rest of the dealers have taken time and expense to travel to Washington and provide us with their perspective on this issue. I also welcome Mr. Press of Chrysler and Mr. Henderson from General Motors. We're honored to have you here today as well. We have some hard questions for you, and I appreciate your willingness to come here today and explain your situation, your perspective, with clear and straight answers. Since American taxpayers now own 60 percent of General Motors, we have a right to know just how the decisions affecting our constituents are made. We also have a duty to make this process more accountable and transparent for all concerned. So let's start with a look at a customer service. And Mr. Henderson, uh, you've spent a pretty large sum of money on newspaper ads recently. I'm sure you're familiar with your own ads, proclaiming your concern for greater transparency and customer service. Yet, um, you've dictated the closure of GM dealerships all across Oregon and the country. And I'll cite one in specific out in Burns, Oregon. Now, if you're a GM customer and the dealership in Burns, Oregon, Rule Teague Motor Company, is closed, your nearest GM dealer is Payette, Idaho, 136 miles away. Now, that's the equivalent of driving from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. to get service for your General Motors vehicle. Since we don't have the three-plus hours it would take to drive there, even in one of the new Camaros, we're using the fastest plane on our Air Force has, the F-15 Eagle and Google Earth, to demonstrate the route while I talk uh, to that uh, new brand of customer service. This will be in 3D for your enjoyment. It'll take a while. Just about a month ago, General Motors and Chrysler sent what were effectively termination notices to about 2,000 auto dealerships nationwide. We're told these notices serve to accelerate restructuring plans that are a must-do step for these troubled automakers. This is so Chrysler and GM can emerge successfully from bankruptcy with stable financial support. Many dealers in the communities they serve frankly feel blindsided. The mid-May notices came in the form of complex take-it-or-leave-it wind-down contracts with just weeks to make important and expensive life-changing decisions about their own livelihoods. Few explanations, no real opportunity to negotiate corrections or even sell to another more favored dealer, and no clear rationale for why they were chosen for closure. Thousands more received continuation contracts, equally complex, which forced them into 18 months of limbo, giving up protections against abusive practices they would normally have been able to be protected against under state franchise law. But they had no choice. It was take it or leave it. Oh, and the agreements, by the way, required the dealers to say they weren't signing under duress. Really. So let's talk about transparency. We have yet to get a clear answer on how the so-called rationalization of dealer networks will save the automakers or taxpayers money. Rationalization seems like the 21st century version of we had to burn the village to save it. I want to hear this morning from GM about how cutting dealers really will save $2 billion. The National Auto Dealers Association argues the dealers cost the automakers little on the margin and provide necessary and convenient outlets for consumer sales and even the local connection the automakers so sorely need. Dealers, even small dealers, make sales and make the automakers money. By what we can gather to date, many dealers affected are not bad Apple operations. Maybe they weren't meeting your mandated sales quotas, but it's hard to see them as cost drains on automaker operations. They often are the mainstays of the local communities they serve. They contribute substantial taxes, support local sports and community events, and they have good reputations. They're established, they're hardworking, and they're struggling in a horrible economic environment. 
and soon their employees will be out of work. By one estimate, the termination notices may cost upwards of 190,000 well-paying jobs. The validity of the cost issue is of particular interest since the press reported yesterday that the House Majority Leader said he had spoken to the White House's auto task force and it acknowledged that the automakers will see no immediate cost savings from closing the dealerships. So Mr. Henderson, you say GM is going to be more accountable. Let's talk about accountability. Who made the closure decisions? How were they made? When were they made? Who made the recent decisions to reverse closures of 41 dealerships? Mr. Anderson, you say GM will be more focused on customers. Let's talk about customers. How is it pro-customer to reduce competition by eliminating dealerships which compete with each other for price and quality and service? It has been said that our domestic automakers own rural America. You know how it is to serve rural America to eliminate the lone dealership in a place like Burns, Oregon. We are still not to Idaho, by the way. We did just pass Stinking Water Pass. In this Alice in Wonderland world of rationalization where up is down and less is more, how are customers served by less competition and higher prices while on the taxpayer's dime better served? In Bend, Oregon, for example, the General Motors terminated the only GM dealership with substantial service repair facilities servicing tens of thousands of people in the 16,000 square mile radius. Do the planners behind this restructuring understand the rural America from whence I come? Do they really understand rural customers, the rural market, the loyalty? Let's talk plainly. If you just want to turn GM and Chrysler into a network of urban dealerships, then tell me, but don't ask me and my constituents to provide the bailout. Or is your plan to use the crisis of bankruptcy as a cheap and quick way to get rid of dealers you don't want, only to eventually sell or put in place, since you don't sell them, a new franchise in a market you've left? If you plan to reduce dealers, can you give me a guarantee that you won't simply get rid of a Bob Thomas only to turn around and offer a GM franchise in Bend to someone else in the coming months? So the goal for me today in today's hearing, Mr. Chairman, is to get straight talk and facts. We need to know the real reasons for the closure decisions and whether they are really justified. We need to know how this is really a good deal for the taxpayer and the consumer. We need to know whether auto dealers targeted for closure in their local communities are getting that fair shake. We all recognize the very tough and painful times for the auto industry, especially its workers and suppliers. The reverberations of Detroit's troubles have already reached into every one of our districts. I look forward to the testimony. I look forward to working with you, Chairman, on further investigating this matter and hope future hearings will focus on the role of the President's Auto Task Force as well. Thank you, Mr. Walden. Mr. Dingell, for opening statement, please. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I commend you for holding this hearing. This is a time of unprecedented hardship for the domestic auto industry, but I feel it's prudent that we objectively examine all aspects of General Motors and Chrysler restructuring plan, including how they affect dealers. Although restructuring of these companies is inevitable and necessary, it means that we are going to have to achieve their long-term viability, but at the same time we are going to have to look to see how it is being done and how it is going to impact on other parts of our economy. Measures must be taken to mitigate excessive hardship on working Americans, especially in a time of grave national recession. In view of this, I will be asking frank questions of our witnesses today. In particular, I seek to determine for the record how GM and Chrysler arrived at the decisions they uh, did related to dealer closures. Public furor over these closures demands truthful answers from these companies regarding these matters, and it is my hope that they will provide much needed insight into the decision making process whose results will affect the livelihood of many thousands of Americans in all parts of the country. Moreover, I understand that GM and Chrysler have approached dealer closures in a markedly dissimilar fashion. And this should again be subject to candid discussion. Finally, I wish to ascertain what steps, if any at all, GM and Chrysler have taken or will take to mitigate the impact of these closures on dealership owners and their employees, and also on the communities. Their fair treatment is paramount to the success of any rational uh, and rationalization of the company's respective value streams. I conclude by encouraging our witness to engage in, in open dialogue with members of the committee about the matters that I have just mentioned. 
The honest disclosure at today's hearings is necessary to restoring the semblance of public trust in the plans for restructure. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our panel, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Dingle. Mr. Barton, for opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to um, thank you and Chairman Waxman for holding this hearing. I want to thank you personally for agreeing to let uh, Mr. Frank Blankenbeckler, who's a dealer in my district, uh, testify. And also thank you for being willing to put a statement in the record of Congressman Latterette, who's not a member of the committee, uh, but has asked to sit on the dais. And uh, uh, you indicated that you would accept unanimous consent to allow his statement into the record. So I, I appreciate all those, uh, uh, all those courtesies. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have a prepared statement, and I will submit it for the record. But I, I want to uh, just kind of speak extemporaneously. I see both sides of this issue. I have a GM assembly plan in my district in Arlington, Texas, that's been in business uh, since 1954. Uh, there's 2,400 people that work there, uh, uh, management about 250, and uh, union UAW workers around 2,200. Um, they've been making cars and trucks in Arlington, Texas for over 50 years. And I've got dealers uh, all over my district, uh, about a dozen of which have received uh, uh, closure or termination or failure to renew notices. Uh, I met yesterday with the, uh, the president of GM North America and also the uh, president of Chrysler. And I see the management side of this, the manufacturing and the business side of it, uh, it's a different era, and we have to make tough decisions to uh, keep U.S. nameplate manufacturing cars and trucks in America. I understand that. But there's, there's, there's another side. There's a human side, a dealer side. And we, we're going to hear from Mr. Frank uh, Blankenbeckler of Waxahachie, Texas. Uh, he is a fourth-generation GM dealer and I think a second-generation uh, Jeep dealer. Uh, his grandfather started selling Chevrolets in Waxahachie, Texas in 1926. Um, he made it through the Great Depression. He made it, his family made it through World War II when you had quotas. They, they made it through the boom years of the 50s. They made it through the uh, gas rationing of the 70s. Um, boom, boom or bust, there's been a blank and Beckler selling cars in Waxahachie, Texas for over 80 years. And in May, he got letters on, on I think, back-to-back, -back, Jeep terminating his contract immediately, or within three weeks, and GM saying they weren't going to redo, renew it. Now, when the GM and the Chrysler people, the managers, were in my office yesterday, they were very sincere. They had their flip charts and they had their notebooks and they could look up and show me if I wanted to see the performance or non-performance of all the dealers in my district. Um, but that doesn't touch on the human story. Again, Carlisle Chevrolet in Waxahachie, Texas has 40 employees. Um, they're not at the bottom of these flow charts. Now, they're not at the top either. But they're not at the bottom. Uh, Mr. Blankenbeckler told me that last year he paid $1.3 million in taxes in Ellis County, employed 40 people, sells an average of um, 50 cars and trucks a month. Uh, in good years, he can double that. And so he, he could do better. He says that. Uh, but his business that's been in his family for four generations, uh, if we can't get Chrysler and GM to take a second look, it's gone. And his son, Austin, who's sitting right out here, um, his opportunity to the American way of life, uh, as we know it, is gone. Now, what I'm asking, Mr. Chairman, is I'm not asking the management of Chrysler and GM to do things that don't make sound business economic sense. But what I am asking is to show a little uh, mercy, if that's the right term, 
every decision doesn't have to be does not have to be the toughest decision you can make. You know, you can err on the side of leniency, and if somebody is selling 50.5 cars a month, and the goal is for them to sell 51, you don't have to cut them off at the knees. So, I, Mr. Chairman, I want to hear from both sides, but I really, hopefully by the end of the day, want to hear from the, uh, the presidents of the manufacturing companies that they will go back and take a second look at some of these decisions. And if there is an opportunity that makes reasonable business sense, that they'll give the, the Frank Blankenbecklers and the people that he represents today an opportunity to continue the, in business. Because if they go out of business, it's gone. And, you know, ultimately, if nobody's selling cars and trucks, it doesn't matter what your manufacturing capability is, nobody's going to buy them. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. As you know, there's another hearing going on downstairs. Uh, uh, Mr. Markey's subcommittee is having a transmission hearing. I've got to run and make a statement down there, too. But I'll be back up here for the question period. And thank you again for your many courtesies. Thank you, Mr. Barton. And uh, members will be moving in and out. And uh, while I'm at it here, I should mention we have other members who are not part of the Energy and Commerce Committee, who are not part of this subcommittee, but are here. Uh, Dan Maffei over here from New York. Uh, I know he has some legislation pending on dealership. That's why he's here. He'll probably be in and out. Patrick Murphy's over here from Pennsylvania, not on committee, but very interested. Uh, you mentioned La Tourette, Mr. Barton. I saw him earlier. I'm sure he'll be popping in and out. I know he has legislation. And in all honesty, uh, I think we have 435 members of Congress. I think 430 contacted me and all wanted their dealer to testify today. Uh, that wasn't possible. But uh, we're to try to get through this hearing. We welcome members who would like to sit and uh, pro watch these proceedings. And, uh, but we're going to have to keep tight time frame on all members who have an opportunity to ask questions. For the members who are here who are not part of the committee, if you have an opening statement you'd like to submit for the record without objection, that would be accepted. And let me go one more thing. Uh, as we were preparing for this hearing, there were some concerns that members may get into the confident confidentiality agreement, or I should say the um, dealer agreement that GM has. And since uh, Chrysler has already emerged out of the bankruptcy, GM is still there. There is a confidentiality agreement with the dealers. And to talk with Mr. Walden here, it is our understanding that, that GM, uh, Mr. Henderson, has, has no objection whatsoever to a dealer testifying before the subcommittee about its business, circumstances, or other matters involving the dealership. Further, it's our understanding that General Motors has no objection to the dealer testifying about the terms of the wind-down agreement itself. And GM is proud of these agreements and the assistance and support they will provide to dealers compared to what they would have received if, under an ordinary bankruptcy proceeding. GM does have concerns, though, on the confidentiality part of these wind-down agreements in two areas. The amount of the wind-down payment set forth in paragraph 3A and any discussions with GM representatives about the wind-down amount found in that agreement. So I'm cautioning members that if we go, if you want to talk about the wind-down agreement, you have a right to. But we're not going to expect the witnesses for proprietary and business reasons to get into financial amounts and things like this with the agreement. Other than that, we're in agreement with that. Mr. Henderson, I'm... That's correct. Right. And Mr. Press, I take it you have no problems as long as you don't get into money exchanges with dealerships? That's correct. Okay. Okay, with that, let's continue with the opening statements. Three-minute opening statement. I'm going to hold you guys to it pretty firm. Next on the list would be Mr. Braley. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Walden. I think you can tell from the interest in this hearing that it's something that affects all 435 congressional districts. And that's why I'm going to submit my uh, written statement and focus instead on the human cost of what we're here to talk about, as Ranking Member Barton was just talking about. And I'm very fortunate, one of my constituents, who is the chairman of the National Auto Dealers Association, John McElhaney from Clinton, I was here because he, he works and sells cars in the heartland. And I think a lot of what we're talking about here today is an explanation of how the decisions that are being made are affecting dealers all over the country. My wife's grandfather, Burt Kalb, was the first Ford dealer in Dubuque, Iowa. And my uncle, Lyle Nusserhoe, came home from World War II and at the request of one of his Navy buddies, moved to my hometown of Brooklyn, Iowa, and started working as a parts manager in a Chevy dealership that he later purchased and worked in for 60 years. 
and I want to talk a little bit about where we've been to get to where we are right now. Because I remember those fall rollouts of new models and the excitement that they brought to my hometown. And I remember those ads that my uncle ran in my hometown newspaper showing all of the employees of his dealership and how many years they had worked there to show the impact that his business was having on our community. Because those same employees were the ones volunteering in the Boy Scouts and the Little League and in school activities. And they were making our community a better place to live. And when you talk about these dealer closures, you're not just talking about the application of economic principles and mathematical formulations. You're talking about the impact on people's lives in every congressional district in this country. And that's why the issues we're going to be discussing today matter. That's why they matter to me, they matter to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, and they matter to the constituents we represent. Because when these dealerships close, they don't just take away the opportunity to buy and get service for your cars and trucks. They take away the lifeblood of these communities. And it's much broader than simply the loss of sales and service. It's part of the fabric of this country. And Mr. Henderson and Mr. Press, your corporations were built on the backs of people like the dealers you see in this room who went out there, invested in their communities, and made you profitable during your boom times. And now I think each of you and your companies owe them and the taxpayers of this com country a detailed explanation for your business decisions because we have to live with the aftermath. And I welcome everyone's testimony on the committee and look forward to further opportunities to question the witness. Thanks, Mr. Braley. Ms. Get for opening statement, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Following up on what Mr. Braley and Mr. Barton said, the, these bankruptcies and, and these closing of the local car dealerships are not just affecting the dealers themselves, but millions of, of people who live in all of our districts who are going to be inconvenienced at the, at the very least. And, and the thing I'm struggling with is if bankruptcy reorganization is designed to help GM and Chrysler become leaner and meaner, become more efficient, then how does it help to close profitable dealerships? Because in my home state of Colorado, for example, 14 profitable Chrysler dealerships are going to be closed, and a number of other GM dealerships and some others. So I guess, I guess the reason why we're concerned is because, on the one hand, we see these profitable dealerships in our districts. On the other hand, we see the need for consolidation and for saving money, but we don't quite understand how closing those profitable dealerships uh, works, especially given the human implications. And that's why we're concerned, and that's why we're having this hearing. I think that our, our, our constituents deserve an explanation. I want to mention one other thing really briefly that's not the subject of this hearing, Mr. Chairman, but might be worth some fur further investigation. As part of the administration's bankruptcy plans, they are, uh, they are putting all of the um, product liability court claims into the bankruptcy court, which is going to wipe out the, the claims of victims who have, who have had defective products. And, and talk about leaner and meaner. This is something that is going to hurt millions of Americans who have been injured by these cars and who don't have some kind of a fund set up through the bankruptcy. Now, in the past, when the government has has helped companies like GM and Chrysler through their bankruptcy plans, like with the asbestos. We set up a fund to compensate victims. But here, there's no fund whatsoever that's been set up to compensate victims. And I think this committee needs to look at this, and I also think the administration needs to revisit their policy of not setting up this kind of fund. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Tegett. Mr. Green from Texas, opening statement, please. Three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Like my colleagues, I'd like my full statement to be placed into the record. Uh, 
Without objection. And I'm glad you're holding this hearing because it's probably one of the biggest issues that I've heard from in our district uh, in a long time. And I guess the problem I have is that um, the, the lack of transparency on how the decisions were made. And I think that's hopefully the witnesses today will, will make some discussion uh, or provide that to us. Uh, I didn't vote for the TARP bill last fall either time. Uh, one of the reasons is, is that uh, I thought it was more of a bailout of Wall Street, not Main Street. And now we're seeing what's happening on Main Street because our dealerships are on Main Street in our area. And I'll give you a great example. Um, the Houston market where I'm from already lost three large volume Chevrolet dealerships. And yet Knapp Chevrolet, one of the oldest dealerships in Houston, actually close to the Central Business District, which opened on December the 6th, 1941, the day before Pearl Harbor Day, it received their letter and their appeal was denied. It's the only Chevy dealership in the downtown area. In fact, it's the only one inside what we call 610 Loop, and there are only two inside Beltway 8, which is miles and miles away. So now people in my district who live in the inner city will have to definitely go to the suburbs to, to have their car serviced or to, to buy a vehicle. More than 4,000 people live in the core of downtown Houston, and 74,000 people live within a two-mile radius and rapidly growing population of about 400,000 live within that five mile radius. And over 140,000 people work in downtown Houston with 17,000 students at downtown colleges. Uh, it seems to me that market is pretty sizable. And Knapp Chevrolet was actually one of the highest uh, profitability in the top 20% for many years. Uh, I guess that's what's frustrating how this decision was made. People working in downtown Houston could drop their cars off and their trucks and get serviced, and then they would shuttle them back and forth. And again, on Wednesday of this week, Knapp Chevrolet re received the, uh, the denial of their appeal for no reasons at all, nothing, uh, just your appeal was denied. Uh, we're losing a lot of high-paying jobs. Uh, we have a lot of high-paying jobs in downtown Houston. I don't know why it is. And that comes from someone who buys Chevrolet and GM products. I drive Chevy trucks. I'm kind of Texas that way, and we're going to uh, continue to buy them. I'm glad they're made in Mr. Barton's district. And I know the witnesses may not be able to uh, answer individually why that happened, but when you lose, in the last year, we've lost three huge Chevy dealerships in the Houston market. Why we would go in and pick one of the oldest and the only one within the inner city uh, to close, it just kind of boggles my mind. And so with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back my time and appreciate you calling this hearing. And like other members, I'm getting ready to go down to the transmission hearing down, down in the room below us, but I'll be back. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Green. Mr. Doyle, for uh, opening statement, please, three minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this hearing, and I want to thank you personally uh, for allowing Jim Golick uh, from Golick Jeep Chrysler, uh, a constituent of mine and, and someone in my district, for test allowing him to testify today. Um, I didn't have a prepared statement, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make a few comments. Uh, my friend Joe Barton says maybe we're in a new era, and, and uh, I, I fear that maybe he's right. You know, uh, growing up in Pittsburgh, I've had the privilege of representing Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the Turtle Creek and Mon Valley in Congress. We're blue collar kids. Our dads and grandfathers made the steel that go into a lot of your cars. We look after one another in Pittsburgh. We buy from our own. We were taught never to buy foreign cars where I grew up. It, it, the thought never would, would occur to us. We buy American, and we buy from the people we know. I remember Mr. Gaddy had the local pharmacy on the corner. He's long gone. There's no more family pharmacies left. <clears throat> it's all the big box stores. Mr. Tamarello had the hardware store where I grew up. No more family hardware stores. Now it's Home Depot, Walmart. But we always had our, our car dealerships. Jim's family has been in business at the same location since 1935 institution in the Mon Valley, in the Turtle Creek Valley. I probably bought three Jeeps. I wouldn't buy a Jeep from anyone else beside the Golics. I don't care that their showroom isn't fancy. I don't care that it's, it's not the newest, most modern looking place, or they don't have a giant floor. What they have is service. They know you when you come in. You don't have to have, they don't, they don't take that little piece of paper back to the manager and say, I'll try to get you a better deal and go through that whole dog and pony show they pull at these big places. They give you a good price right up front and they take care of you. That's, that's why I buy Jeeps there. I, I wouldn't think of going anywhere else. 
I raised my family on Dodge Caravans. My wife Susan and I, we have four children. That car took care of our family for years. I owned a bunch of them. Got it from another local family dealership. We're losing that. We're losing that in this country. This idea that you can buy from people you know and trust, that you know we're going to take care of. You don't have to guess if they're going to take care of you. You know they're going to take care of you. That's why I buy the cars I buy at the places I buy. Now, Jim tells me he's met his quota plus every year since he's been in business. These guys started out in 1935 a Hudson dealer. Then it was, then it was Jeep, Jeep Eagle, you know, then Jeep Chrysler when, when, when Chrysler uh, come through. <clears throat> you can't take people like this off. You, you, you just can't replace people like this. I, I can't imagine myself, I've never bought a foreign car, but I can't imagine myself ever buying a Jeep again if, if the Golics aren't in business in Pittsburgh. Uh, I don't understand how they're costing you money. I think they're a revenue stream for you guys. And if for some reason this has to happen, I want to know why you're not taking care of people who spent 70 years and generations selling your cars, and as you tell them that they don't have a business anymore, that you're not doing something to help these guys out in the transition. So I, I have lots of questions, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm just glad that you're holding this hearing today so that I can ask them. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. Ms. Sutton from Ohio, please. Thank you, Chairman Stupak, for holding the hearing, and thank you very much for inviting one of my constituent dealers, Alan Spitzer, here to testify today. Mr. Spitzer is losing seven of his Chrysler dealerships, um, and additionally, there are two other Chrysler dealerships in my district that are being eliminated. Across Ohio, 47 Chrysler dealerships are being eliminated, and the Ohio Auto Dealers Association estimates that 130 GM dealerships may be cut. The impacts of these decisions on families and local economies will be substantial. And we heard from the distinguished gentleman from Pennsylvania, and I associate myself with his remarks. On average, 43 people work at a dealership in Ohio where the average pay is $44,000 a year. With these closings, millions of dollars of income will disappear with the jobs. And those jobs are lost on top of the 2,000 auto manufacturing jobs that will be eliminated by the closing of the Chrysler Twinsburg plant, the GM Mansfield Metal Center plant, and GM's powertrain unit in Parma. These dealers and their employees, they're not merely statistics. They have families, they have mortgages, and dare I say, they have car payments. And in the time that I've been in Congress, we've been fighting. We've been fighting hard to try and keep those jobs in America. Because if people do not have good jobs in the United States, they're not going to have any money to buy things. And they can't be consumers. And over the last few months, along with my colleagues, many of them in this room, we've been working on the Consumer Assistance to Recycle and Save Act, known as the CARS Act, which passed earlier this week. And through the CARS Act, manufacturers, it's going to help manufacturers, and it's, uh, it's going to help auto-related jobs throughout the country while improving the environment and helping consumers. But again, it's called the CARS Act, but it's really not about cars. It's about people. It's about the people who produce those cars. And our job here, we, the actions that we've been taking, and it's really important to understand, have not been taken just to preserve the brands of GM and Chrysler. It's been preserved, it, it's to preserve the jobs, the jobs that our families and our friends and our neighbors and our communities depend upon for their tax base, to fund their police and their fire and their schools and their other city services. It's about people. And the impact of the decisions that have been made have been extreme and they've been uh, decimating to many. Now, we've been trying to get answers and trying to understand the rationale that has uh, been undertaken to come to these decisions. And I think you've heard it here today that we don't get it. We don't understand it. And we want to know why, if you're trying to sell more cars, why having less salespeople to do it, who have been committed to do it for years and decades on end, will result in more sales. That just doesn't seem logical to many of us here or logical to many of the people who are out there in our communities about to become jobless or who have become jobless because of the decisions that have been taken. 
So I'm interested in hearing about that, and I'm also interested in, in making sure and hearing the commitment, hopefully, from the companies about how we're going to keep the market share that is of cars that are being sold in the United States from the companies at its present level or increase it so that we're not selling more cars from GM or Chrysler that are imported. Because again, we haven't been taking these actions to save the brands. We've been taking these actions to save our manufacturing base, strengthen our nation, and to preserve the jobs of so many that are in our districts and across the country. And I yield back. Thank, thank you, Ms. Sutton. And the CARS Act that she mentioned is really called Cash for Clunkers, as we call it. Uh, she was the lead author. Uh, along myself, Mr. Dingo, a bunch of us on this committee. In fact, it went through this committee. We went to the floor. We had votes on the floor this week. We got that passed. It's actually now in conference. So the cash for clunkers, hopefully next week we can have that done. So this committee has always been supportive of the auto industry, no doubt about that. And last but not least, Mr. Welch from Vermont, opening statement, three minutes, please. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Walden. I really appreciate you calling this hearing. I'm going to be repetitive. The reason I'm going to be repetitive is that this is a, this is a catastrophe uh, for every community uh, where we have car dealers that have been doing a good job. And you, you guys know it. I mean, Mike Doyle was talking about the family dealerships. I was talking to the, the Handys, 52 years, father to son, uh, supporting Little League teams, providing good service, good jobs in their community, and they get a letter telling them no. Uh, Wade Walker is here from Vermont, uh, one of our great car dealers who has been playing a lead role. And you have heard these stories one after another, and it doesn't seem to sink in. One of the things that is bewildering to us is that, as we understand it, the car dealers pay basically for everything. Every single thing that they, uh, they get from uh, the manufacturers they have to pay for, from brochures uh, to signs. And I just asked Wade to put together a few facts for me. Twenty-two-hundred bucks he has to pay. Uh, every year, $21,000 actually for special tools. Uh, these are tools you could go down the street and get uh, for next to nothing, and they got to pay $21,000 to the manufacturers because that's part of the deal. $2,000 for parts and service promotion, $3,200 to put up a sign. Your sign they have to put up every year, they have to sign a, a contract, and I guess it's a 10 year contract, they got to pay for that. $3,200 uh, per employee to uh, send a service training. $10,000 to hook up to the computer, $5,000 for the, for the brochures. So it's money out of their pocket that supports the, deal, the manufacturers. So it's very hard for us to understand why it is these guys uh, are, quote, a drain on the business model. Secondly, I think what you're hearing from all of us is that there's something wrong with the business model that basically says in order to survive, we've got to crush our local dealers. We've got to take out of the community some of the folks in the community that have been doing the most to create a sense of community and to provide local jobs. I mean, the economy has to be about making a living in our local communities. And we are going dead wrong if we can't have a business model that rewards local success and gives people in a community they are willing to take a risk to do a job, provide a service, be related to their customers if they don't have a place in the economy and in the, in the, in the auto uh, uh, future of this country. You know, it is almost as though each one of the manufacturers wants to uh, have one dealer on steroids that can sell to everybody in the country uh, over the Internet. And it just ain't going to work. So, Mr. Chairman and uh, uh, Mr. Walden, I really appreciate you having this hearing. Uh, my hope is that we can find a way where there is a place that includes our local car dealers that have been doing so much for so many for so long. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Uh, good. You got time, Jen. If you have an opening statement, uh, a three-minute opening statement, now would be a time. Give yourself a second, get situated there. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chairman. I appreciate uh, this hearing and the circumstances that bring us here today are really unfortunate. Despite signs that the economic downturn has slowed and maybe even uh, turning uh, around, many Americans are still unemployed or fearful of losing their jobs. And for some, this fear is, for many, this fear is very real. 
Two iconic companies here today, Chrysler and GM, are closing more than 2,000 dealerships nationwide with potential job losses numbering in the hundreds of thousands. This move will impact every state and city in the United States. On Tuesday, 789 Chrysler dealerships closed their doors, including some in Chicago, about where I'm from, about 2,500 GM dealers closed by the end of the year. There are three GM dealers in my district and another four nearby that my co co constituents depend on. There's been no public announcement of whether any of those businesses will close, but the employees and their families go to sleep every night wondering what the news will bring in the morning. And I'm glad that this committee will have the opportunity to review how the decisions are made to close certain dealerships. Closures of local businesses of this magnitude will severely harm communities and local economies that are already strained and nationwide. These closures have an exponentially larger effect. We have to determine whether the process used for deciding whether and which dealers to close was fair to all involved. We also have to begin to think about how to assist those who have lost or will lose their jobs. In addition, we must look to the future of our nation's historic auto industry. I have no doubt that these brands will be able to make a comeback building and selling the cars and trucks of the future, ones that are energy efficient, innovative, and uniquely American. Also, while this may not be the primary focus of this hearing, it has been brought to my attention that there are concerns about how GM and Chrysler's restructuring will affect injury and liability claims from current customers. I think this issue is important and is something that we may want to consider in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence, and I yield back. Thank you. That concludes the opening statements of all members of the Oversight Investigation Subcommittee. Uh, let me introduce our first panel of witnesses. Some of the members have uh, asked to introduce some of them. I'll, I'll yield to them at that appropriate time and keep your comments brief. Um, but first, we have uh, Mr. James Press, who is President of Chrysler LLC. Mr. Fritz Henderson, Chief Executive Officer of General Motors Corporation. Uh, Mr. Braley, you want to introduce Mr. John McAuley? Yes, I'm very pleased to have uh, John McElhaney, who's the chairman of the National Auto Dealers Association and also president of McElhaney Auto Center in Clinton, Iowa, in my district, and also uh, has another franchise in Iowa City. Welcome, John. Uh, Mr. Alan Spitzer of Spitzer Automotive Group of El Betty, help me out, El Raya, Ohio. Illyria. Illyria. You want to introduce him? Mr. Spitzer, as I said in my opening statement, has uh, been in the business a long time in uh, Illyria and the surrounding area. A um, hundred years, I believe, in, in the, uh, the, the auto dealership. Well, uh, those are pretty deep roots, and I am uh, honored and I'm grateful, Mr. Chairman, that you brought Mr. Spitzer here to share. Uh, his experience not only in, in obviously providing our communities with the cars they need to drive, but helping to uh, shore up so much within our community by sponsoring organizations and contributing to, uh, to the quality of life there. Next, we have Mr. Bob Thomas. Uh, Mr. Walden, you'd like to say a few words there? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Thomas is a constituent of mine from Bend, Oregon. His grandfather formed the dealership for General Motors in 1918. Um, he served as a lieutenant in the U.S. Marine Corps from 1969 to 1972. He's a graduate of Stanford University. Serves on the boards of the United Way of Deschutes County, Greater Bend Rotary, St. Charles Hospital Foundation, Boys and Girls Club, Bend Chamber of Commerce, Oregon State University, Cascades Campus, and the Central Oregon Visitors Association. The kind of person you'd want to represent your company in Central Oregon. Next is Mr. Daniel Kikanap of Tacoma Dodge in Tacoma, Washington. He was requested by Mr. Dix. Am I saying your name right or wrong? Mr. Kikanap. Kikanap. Okay. Thanks for being here. And Mr. Dix uh, asked that you be here. Uh, Mr. James Golick, Mr. Doyle, you want to say a few words there? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome my friend Jim Golick uh, at today's hearing. Jim and his family have. Uh, Golick Chrysler Jeep have been at the same location in Pittsburgh since 1935, uh, a business that's still owned and operated by his family. They started with a Hudson franchise, then Golick sold cars from AMC, Jeep, and later Eagle. Several mergers later, Golick was a successful Jeep Eagle dealer till 1999, 
In 2000, they acquired the Chrysler franchise. Now they're a Chrysler Jeep dealer and have sold over 10,000 new and used vehicles over the last few decades. They have consistently held the highest customer satisfaction rating for sales and service in the state of Pennsylvania. And I welcome you, Jim. Next is Mr. Dwayne Paddock of Paddock Chevrolet in Kenmore, uh, New York. Thanks for being here. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Barton's not back, is Mr. Frank Blankenbeckler, the third of Carlisle Chevrolet Company of Wackahatchee, Texas. Uh, Frank is here with his son, Austin, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Joe, do you want to say anything about your witness? Is it time to introduce him? It is. I just did a half-hearted job, but uh, All right. you know him better than I do. Go ahead. I've been down in, I've been, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I've been down in the electricity hearing. Uh, it is my honor to introduce uh, uh, Frank Blankenbeckler. Uh, he is a native of Waxahachie, Texas, graduated from Waxahachie High School, went to the University of Texas where he uh, lettered in basketball, and came back home to Waxahachie and entered the business that his grandfather started in 1926. Uh, he is one of the civic leaders in Waxahachie. They have, uh, he and his family have been major donors to uh, every civic improvement in the last 50 years in that community. And as I said in my opening statement last year, his business and the 40 employees uh, generated revenues that resulted in over $1.3 million in taxes being paid uh, to various uh, state, local, and federal entities. Uh, he is considered one of the leading entrepreneurs, businessmen, philanthropist of uh, his hometown, and I consider him to be a personal friend. So we're honored to have him here. And as I said earlier, I think he represents hundreds, if not thousands, of family-owned dealerships that have been in business for, for decades, and uh, most of those dealerships hopefully want to continue in a positive business relationship that is positive for themselves and for General Motors and Chrysler and Ford, who's not here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And so also my understanding, Mr. Blanken Beckler's son, Austin's here, right? He's also in the car business. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's our first panel of witnesses. It's the policy of this subcommittee to take all testimony under oath. Please be advised that you have the right to be advised by counsel during your testimony. Do any of you wish to be represented by counsel? Everyone's shaking their head no. If at any time you wish to be advised by counsel, let me know before you answer a question and we'll accommodate that. Therefore, since we take uh, our testimony under oath, I'm going to ask you all to rise. Please raise your right, right hand to take the oath. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but truth, a matter pending before this committee? Let the record reflect that the witnesses replied in the affirmative. You're all now under oath. We're going to start with your opening statement, which would also be under oath. I'm going to ask you to please limit it to five minutes. We have an unusually large panel. Uh, that's because of all the interest in, in this hearing. Uh, Mr. Press, if you don't mind, we'll start with you. And then we'll do Mr. Henderson, then Mr. McInerney, and then we'll go Mr. Thomas and Mr. Blankenbeckler, Mr. Paddock, Mr. Kikinap, Mr. Spitzer, and Mr. Golick. That will be the order. Mr. Press, would you like to start, please, five minutes? Thank you. Chairman Stupak, Ranking Member Walden, and members of the committee, I appreciate this opportunity to discuss why a realigned dealer network is important to the new Chrysler Group. Despite completing a painful restructuring, the new Chrysler Group will retain 86 percent of its dealers by volume and 75 percent by location. I empathize with the dealers who were not brought forward into the new company, and I surely understand their disappointment. This has been the most difficult business action I have ever personally taken. I'd like to begin first by answering the four questions that I have been asked most often while I've been here in Washington. First, was discontinuing these dealers really necessary for Chrysler's survival? The answer is absolutely yes. Today's automotive industry cannot support the number of dealers currently in the marketplace. We've gone from 17 million new vehicle sales in 2006 to less than 10 million today. As a whole, the Chrysler dealer network is not profitable and not viable. In 2008, the average U.S. auto dealer sold 525 vehicles and made a profit of $279,000. The Chrysler dealer average was 405 vehicles and lost $3,431. Without profits, dealers can't invest in people or training, facilities, 
As a result, sales and customer satisfaction suffers. The old Chrysler's multiple dealer channel was too costly to support. I'll give some examples of that in a moment. And to complete our bankruptcy process and our alliance with Fiat, we needed a realigned new dealer network for the new company to emerge on day one. On June 9th, the bankruptcy court authorized the discontinuation of our dealer agreements as part of our optimization plan. In his order, Judge Gonzalez said the dealer restructuring plan was, quote, an exercise of sound business judgment made in good faith and for legitimate commercial reasons, unquote. The judge also said in his ruling that the dealer reorganization was, quote, appropriate and necessary. On June 10th, the, the Fiat Chrysler Alliance was launched with a right-sized new dealer network. Second question, dealers don't cost the company anything, do they? Well, in fact, they do. The cost to Chrysler of an oversized dealer network includes both lost sales and excessive spending. First of all, dealers have a minimum sales responsibility every year. It's realistic and conservative and based on their average sales of Chrysler sales. Underperforming dealers cost unit sales as well as revenue. In 2008, of the 789 discontinued dealers, 80% of them were below their minimum sales responsibility, which translated into 55,000 lost sales, $1.5 billion in lost revenue. Second, the old Chrysler dealer network included many dealers that sell only one or two of the three brands. This has led to tremendous redundancies and inefficiencies in product development and brand strategy. For example, we spent $1.4 billion in the last product cycle in engineering and development cost for sister vehicles that did not return one cent of incremental profit or sales. For example, Chrysler currently supplies dealers with two similar minivans, two similar full-size sport utilities, two similar mid-size SUVs, and two similar sedans. We cannot afford to produce unique products any longer and that's one of the real reasons that the company had to declare bankruptcy. Other cost inefficiencies include $150 million annually in marketing and advertising, $33 million annually in just administrative costs uh, to work with the dealer body. Third question, uh, my discontinued dealer says he's profitable. Well, so why not keep him? Profitability alone is not an adequate measure to determine a dealer's viability or value to Chrysler's future. Chrysler's discontinued dealers were, for the most part, the least profitable dealers in the network. In the network. On average, the discontinued dealers lost $73,000 last year. But of course, some of them are profitable. Yes, some of them are profitable. But their new Chrysler business may not be. In fact, most of the profitability of these dealers in question is driven from used car business or the sales of other makes in the same business. Several problems beyond profitability contributed to certain dealers being discontinued. Many dealers are in the wrong location. 555 of the 789 are standalone. They do not have all three brands. They aren't viable. We can no longer produce products to keep those dealers alive. 50% sell 100 or fewer vehicles per year. 84% sell more used than new. 44% sell competing brands from the same showroom. Here's a typical example, a Dodge dealer in the Mid-Atlantic area. This, this dealer is profitable, but he also sells Buick, Pontiac, Subaru, Isuzu, and of his new car sales, Dodge only represents 3% of his sales, total sales for his dealership last year. That's a good example of the situation that we face. So while some of the 789 dealers may be profitable, chances are they're making money selling used cars, competitive vehicles, and by our assessment, they're a drag on the network in total. Um, the last page of my presentation isn't here, but I'll paraphrase it very quickly. And that is that this is a very painful process. Going through bankruptcy was not our, our choice. Uh, the company is no longer a functioning organization. Uh, we've had to make some very difficult decisions in business that would assure by making these tough calls for 789 dealers, we've got 2,391 dealers not represented here in small towns with little leagues, with a lot of employees whose jobs and businesses saved, as long with the full enterprise of our company, the suppliers, and the rest of the nation. Uh, this was a very difficult decision that we've made. Uh, it's one that we want to share with you in terms of transparency. 
We have taken every step to make this a soft landing for the dealers involved, and you will find out soon that all of the vehicles in the discontinued dealers have been redistributed, along with most of the parts and almost the, uh, the uh, equipment. Uh, we stand ready to answer your questions and respond to any suggestions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Press. Mr. Henderson, your opening statement, please. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Stupak and Ranking Member Walden. They want to pull that action. just a bit closer, right? Yep. Let me get this here. Behind each action we are taking to reinvent GM, there is a human story. Our dealers are part of the larger GM family. They are valued business partners and, for many consumers, the face of General Motors. However, the sacrifices, all painful, that we are all making are necessary to put GM on a brighter path to a long-term viability and success. We owe this to the U.S. taxpayer. In essence, this is, this is our last chance to delever reduce, and, and reduce debt, to operate under competitive labor agreements, to have the manufacturing capacity that matches today's market realities, and most importantly, to continue to design and build winning cars and trucks with leading technology. We simply cannot undergo this sweeping transformation without a comparable effort to reshape our retail network, one which was largely created in the 50s and the 60s. We have been called upon to make tough commercial decisions, and we will do so responsibly and compassionately. And in the case of our dealers, to act as carefully, responsibly and objectively as we can to help them wind down their businesses in an orderly fashion with a structured assistance package that benefits them relative to their alternatives. This approach is in stark contrast to what happens in most contracts in bankruptcy, where contracts are typically simply rejected with no assistance. And unfortunately, we are a company today in bankruptcy. Let me first discuss cost and then sales opportunities that are relevant to these dealer decisions. A concentrated excuse me, and highly profitable dealer network will reduce costs for GM at a time when every dollar is precious. These cost savings come in two categories. A right-sized network of strong dealers will allow GM to systematically, and this is over time, reduce direct dealer support programs, which today involve for General Motors about $2 billion here in the U.S., or approximately $1,000 per retail sale. This is a gross savings of a little less than a million dollars per discontinued dealer. This, however, does not take place immediately because these support programs, or in fact subsidies, have been incorporated over many years to help dealer profitability as our dealer network has unfortunately weakened financially. To the best of our knowledge, our best-in-class competitors today bear few, if any, of these costs. Our consolidation will also provide an estimated $415 million in gross fixed cost savings potential. Items like guaranteed local advertising, excuse me, assistance, service and training and information technology systems, or a potential of approximately $180,000 per dealer. Second, our dealer consolidation is not just about saving money, but about creating opportunity and revenue growth. It is about our dealers augmenting our efforts to greatly enhance consumer perception in our products, brands and General Motors directly and on a daily basis. That is why in every other aspect of the retail business, from Harley-Davidson to Apple stores and, yes, Toyota and Honda, you see the pre that a premium is placed on creating a distinct, consistent and top-notch retail experience. That is why we are building a profitable business plan for between 3,500 and 3,800 U.S. dealers by the end of 2010, which with a retail sales market of over 10 million units and a conservative share assumption would allow our dealers to approximately double their throughput. For dealers, this translates into a greater return on investment, better profits and the ability to attract and retain new customers and the best people to service our vehicles. Finally. Even with these cutbacks, GM will still have the largest dealer network in the country, more than any of our competitors. In our case, around 3,600 versus, for example, Toyota's at 1,200. This would include an extensive rural network of 1,500 dealers nationally in markets where we hold today, on average, more than a 10-point advantage in market share. While we are operating with the highest sense of urgency, it is equally important we get this process right considering the personal and financial stakes at hand. We recognize we won't get every call right. That is why we are listening and working with the dealers and with the NADA to give us all a better understanding of their concerns. As a result, we have sent our dealers a letter this week clarifying various subjects in the participation agreement, most notably dueling with competitive makes and performance standards. So what is the current status of our work in this important front? We have in place an appeals process and have, cons have considered 856 appeal requests as of yesterday and have granted 45.
We'll continue to evaluate all GM dealers against a common set of performance standards to ensure that our selection process is fair and robust. As of today's deadline, we're encouraged by the progress we're making and the overall dealer response has been strong. Approximately 99% of GM dealers have signed or verbally agreed to our participation agreements, while almost 96% have done so with the wind down agreements. In closing, we're deeply grateful for the support of these dealers. They're helping to create a viable GM that will preserve over 200,000 jobs at GM's remaining dealers, along with hundreds of thousands of jobs with GM's direct manufacturing and supply network. We're also grateful for the support for your support during this critical time. We take our responsibility to the American taxpayers very seriously and we promise to be open and transparent in all we do every step of the way. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Mr. McElney, please, National Auto Dealer Association. our understanding of the Chrysler and GM bankruptcy proceedings. The lack of transparency during this government structured process has compounded our concerns about the treatment. Thank you. About the treatment of dealers throughout this ordeal. In the initial viability submissions, Chrysler mentioned nothing other than continuing their current program to facilitate dealer consolidation. Yet bankruptcy has left 789 Chrysler dealerships without franchises on 26 days notice without even buying back their vehicles, parts, and factory-specific tools. No manufacturer has ever done this. GM's original viability submissions reflected the desire to eliminate some brands, and its call for additional dealer consolidation was over an extended period of time. Now, besides the brand eliminations, 1,350 additional GM dealers face terminations on a much more aggressive timeline. Why this dramatic shift? In response to a question before the Senate Banking Committee on June 10th, Ron Bloom of the Auto Task Force said, and I quote, we did not give the companies a numerical target, but we certainly did say regarding plants, regarding dealers, regarding white and blue collar headcount, regarding all these matters that you need to be more aggressive, close quote. Everyone agrees that these companies need to decrease cost and increase revenue, but dealer cuts do not achieve these goals. The other key elements of the restructurings provide direct and timely cost savings to GM and to Chrysler. In sharp contrast, terminating a dealership does not provide any material cost savings. The retail network, the land, the buildings, the employees, training, the dealers pay for all of this. As detailed in my written testimony, we dispute the notion that the dealer network imposes any significant per vehicle cost or any significant administrative costs on the manufacturers. Indeed, company officials have been widely quoted as saying that the manufacturer's costs do not vary whether there are 6,000 dealers or 3,000 dealers. Moreover, the faster, deeper approach of the auto task force will actually reduce manufacturer revenue at this critical juncture. Over 90% of Chrysler and GM's revenues come from the dealers because the dealers buy the cars, the parts, and even the dealership signs from the manufacturers. Automakers will tell you that it takes at least 18 months to regain the sales of a closed dealership. And that's the best case scenario. In short, the dealer terminations will cause revenue losses for the manufacturers without any corresponding cost savings. As such, we do not see how these cuts make economic sense. Not for the companies, not for the dealers, not for local communities, and certainly not for the struggling U.S. economy. Now I'll turn to the status of the GM agreements, both the participation agreements for those dealers going forward and the wind down agreements for those dealers who lose their franchises. Last week during my testimony to the Senate Commerce Committee, I voiced NADA's concerns about the extremely one-sided participation agreements delivered to 4,000 dealers of the new GM. During that hearing, Mr. Henderson committed to meet with NADA to discuss our concerns. GM followed through on that commitment. Our leadership met with senior GM officials last Friday, and we had a very frank discussion. 
As a result, GM has agreed to make significant improvements in the participation agreement. Additionally, GM is committed to clarify some of the terms of the wind-down agreements, and NADA will continue to work with GM to improve these agreements. We appreciate GM's efforts to interact with NADA on these crucial matters. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you again for convening this hearing because we still have fundamental concerns. These government-negotiated bankruptcies continue to threaten dealer rights under state motor vehicle franchise laws. These laws inject balance in the inherently unbalanced economic relationship between a dealer and the manufacturer, and they also provide consumers a reliable, convenient, and competitive auto retail network. Therefore, Congress should ensure that the franchise laws of 50 states apply with full force and effect, especially when the new Chrysler and the new GM are operating outside of bankruptcy. We urge members of Congress to support H.R. 2743, which would restore fundamental rights to dealers. We stand ready to work with you to achieve this goal. Thank you for holding this important hearing, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. We're going to go from my left to right uh, with the dealers. Mr. Thomas, would you like to begin? Uh, pull that mic over, turn on to get a green light, and speak into it so uh, we can hear you, and they can also pick it up. Is your mic on, sir? Push the button. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, right. Ranking Member Walden. May 15, 11 a.m., the FedEx truck arrives. Employees watch as the driver hands me the thin cardboard envelope that contains our destiny. I received an unsigned letter from General Motors. The tone of the letters was vague and referred to criteria but not specific methodology, neither stating the relative importance of each nor how great a period of time was being referenced. The letter stated, Quote, we don't think we will be able to renew your contract in October 2010. This is not final. Submit what you like by the end of the month to this email address. The significance of this letter became clear on June 2 when the content of the vague letter had been construed into the offer of a wind-down agreement. The agreement offered on the 2nd had to be returned in time to arrive in Detroit by the 12th, a scant, a scant 10 days to decide one's options to confer with professionals regarding unprecedented legal matters and loved ones about our financial and professional future. My grandfather immigrated to the U.S. in 1900 and by 1918 had established himself as a Chevrolet dealer in Bend, Oregon. His daughter married my father and he was a dealer until 1982 when I succeeded him. Our company has woven itself into a, the social fabric of the community since the time it was a village. Our family has provided automobile sales and service, civic leadership, and community involvement every year continuously since 1916. These are hard times for Bend, but not as difficult as those we survived in the Great Depression and the World Wars. General Motors has been with us the whole time from 1918 forward. We have been GM to our community. Now it is a dark time when GM must abandon our town, our region, and us. Just as GM is an icon, we enjoy iconic status in our region, always there, always helpful and compassionate, always acting responsibly. The letters we garnered in support to our appeal to GM were humbling in their appreciation of our caliber and quality of service and community support. Moreover, there was confusion as to why Bend, now 80,000 strong, will be abandoned, as will we, their dealer of choice, the largest GM dealership in central and eastern Oregon. Their world is crumbling. Things they thought they could count on being are taken away. Long-standing reliability, integrity, a safe harbor, in a very real sense, our customers are afraid. Who benefits from this taking, this cancellation that is so unnecessary, so wrong, so wrongly executed? Not GM. Having no dealer in Bend will not increase GM sales. Not the 216,000 people in our region who are left solely with a small GM dealer in a tiny town at its perimeter with limited inventory and repair capacity. Not our community who has relied on us always to generously support its activities. Not our employees who are highly trained to work on sophisticated GM products like Cadillac and Chevrolet and service clientele with courtesy and compassion. Not our customers who bought our products thinking like we did that we would be here forever. That's our business model, the longest term you can imagine. Always do it right. Be here for the long haul. Earn the loyalty of your clientele and they will reward you with long-term patronage. Over the years, that's been GM's business model too. And we were a good fit for 91 years until we got cut from the team. 
Why are these cuts necessary? I recently attended a meeting of letter recipients in Oregon. Who was there? A room full of respectable business people with whom I have attended GM business meetings for 30 years. Obviously, they are able business people to have survived, as have we. The marketplace should be the sole arbiter of who should fall by the wayside, not the arbitrary acts of well-meaning administrators. If the plan to replace us with another GM dealer why have we been deprived of the opportunity to make such a transaction with their approval? Will our market be awarded to a GM favorite or insider? This would seem to be an unreasonable and wrongful taking of a valuable asset, nurtured through the years only to be snatched by an overreaching at a moment of opportunity inside the bankruptcy. And what of the inventory that remains? In our case, some $4 million, the value of which could shrink by a million or more from what we paid. Over a year's supply of G GM cars await our sale. A half a million dollars of parts cannot be returned. What I would hope for in such dire straits would be a request of reason. Allow us to provide support for those GM customers in our region and relieve us of the inventory obligations we incurred in good faith by repurchasing at what we paid. This is a small price to pay for potentially depriving a long and faithful associate of its livelihood. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Blankenbeckler, uh, your opening statement, please, sir. My name is Frank A. Blankenbeckler III. I'm the dealer principal of Carlisle Chevrolet Cadillac Jeep in Waxahachie, Texas. To my knowledge, the oldest Chevrolet dealership in the state of Texas. The Cadillac line was added in 1990, and the Jeep line was added around 1978. This dealership was operated continuously in the same community under the same family ownership since 1926. The dealership was founded in 1926 by my maternal grandfather, Y.C. Carlisle. My father, Frank A. Blankenbeckler, Jr., who was awarded a bronze star for his service to his country at Baston during World War II and who received a master's in tax law from Harvard, married my mother in 1947, and moved to Waxahachie to be the dealer at Carlisle Chevrolet for the next 55 years. I graduated from the University of Texas in 1974 with an MBA. Since that time, I've had one job. I've been a GM Jeep dealer for nearly 35 years. Approximately three years ago, my son graduated from Ole Miss and joined me at the dealership to fulfill his childhood dream of being an automobile dealer like his father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather before him. During these 84 years of dealership ownership and operation, my family has been one of the most generous and civic-minded in Waxahachie. My family was very instrumental in the founding of Baylor Hospital there. The YMCA served on the school board and made many other numerous contributions, too numerous to mention. The point of this type of introduction is to state that my family has been an integral and generous part of Waxahachie for a long time. On May 13th, I received a letter from Chrysler. It stated I would no longer be a Jeep dealer after June 9. On May 14th, I received a letter from GM stating that my Chevrolet and Cadillac dealer agreements would not be extended beyond 2010. In 24 hours, I was told that everything my family and I have worked for for 84 years would be taken away with no compensation. I've introduced a folder which conveys some facts about Carlisle Chevrolet. I would like to request this folder and the balance of my testimony to be entered into the record. Uh, without objection, uh, Mr. Walden had supplied it to the committee. Without objection, they'll be part of your testimony. The pages of this folder show the location of the dealership, include an article by the local paper and a page of facts about the dealership. I would particularly encourage you to look at the total amount of taxes paid by Carlisle in 2008, about $1.3 million. It contains sales history, CSI scores, and a couple of articles about the dealership that is located next door. I can assure you that Carlisle is not the bottom of the heap in regards to its peers per this folder. I want to make mention of my employees. Over the years, Carlisle has had numerous employees that have worked for my family for 35 to 50 years. Time doesn't permit me to do them justice. My point is Carlisle has had and currently has the best people in the industry. I would like to mention to the committee the human element of these actions by GM and Chrysler. Nearly 90 souls depend on Carlisle for their existence. 
With our closing, these people will be subjected to serious economic hardship. I've had numerous offers to sell my business. I have had that right taken away. My family be will be left with a single purpose dealership facility with no tenant. This is senseless. My grandfather paid for Carlisle Chevrolet from his labors. My father paid my grandmother for Carlisle Chevrolet through his efforts. It took me nearly 20 years to pay my parents for Carlisle Chevrolet. It took GM and Chrysler a mere 24 hours to take Carlisle Chevrolet from me. This makes no sense. Why is this happening? GM and Chrysler have stated publicly they have not used the bankruptcy code to usurp state and local motor vehicle codes and statutes. This is patently not true. I don't care how it's spun. GM dealers have offered either a wind-down agreement or a participation agreement. The content of these agreements is horrible. Dealers are told to either sign the agreements or GM will petition the bankruptcy court to have them immediately terminated. There is no alternative to signing these new agreements. This is wrong. Now I'd like to address what I think is the most important part of my testimony. In a period of 24 hours, my business was essentially taken from me with no real explanation other than that these are difficult times. How in this country can a man's property be taken without due process and without compensation and apparently given to another dealer with better political collections who has been in my community for less than a year for nothing? I adamantly think my constitutional rights have been violated. I think I'm a victim of an illegal taking. This is the most important point of this hearing in my mind, and I think it is the feeling of all the dealers that are in the same position. I feel like it should be the concern of all Americans. When your property rights are destroyed, how long will it be until it happens to you? I'm hurt. I feel violated, and I'm extremely upset. I wear my father's Rod Star label pin on my coat. He was truly a member of the greatest generation. I'm glad that he is not alive to witness this terrible injustice, to have risked his life for a country that do what they're doing would have destroyed him. I love my country, and I love my state. I feel great pain in what is happening. It is hope, it is my hope and my prayer that I will be able to continue my life and not be consumed by bitterness should this situation not be reversed and this country not return to the tenets of the founding fathers who created it. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Thank you. Mr. Paddock, uh, your opening statement, please, sir. You might want to pull that mic a little closer. They don't pick up as well as we think they do. Thanks. Good morning. I am a go forward dealer. My name is Dwayne Paddock, dealer owner of Paddock Chevrolet in Kenmore, New York, where we employ 135 of the finest, most hardworking Americans in the Buffalo area. I'm proud to say that Paddock Chevrolet is currently the largest GM dealership in the nation, and we have been proudly serving Western New York for almost 75 years. I'm really pleased to be here today. It seems especially appropriate, for me at least, since my father passed away exactly 15 years ago to this day. It was on that day the livelihoods of, employees that, of my employees were passed on to my hands, and our company's responsibility to our community had to be preserved. In addition to my responsibilities at the dealership, I serve as chairman of GM's National Dealer Council, known as the NDC, for the past two and a half years, a position I was elected to by my fellow GM dealers. The state of our industry is this. The U.S. marketplace for automobiles is the most open and competitive in the world. With that competition taking place across a wide variety of brands, competing dealers, and now the Internet. But it is a recognized fact that since 2006, a rapid decline of our retail business across all automakers, domestic and foreign, has occurred. Our industry has gone from an annual selling pace of over 17 million un units to just, oh, just more than 9 million. My fellow dealers, every brand, both GM and non-GM, have suffered huge financial losses in a very short period of time. The amount of working capital necessary to fund their day-to-day -day operations has been severely diminished. In addition, 
bank loans to dealers for working capital are essentially non-existent. As I sit before you today, I'm a franchisee of a company going through a painful restructuring, a restructuring that is not only necessary, but it is critical to, our to the future of our customers, suppliers, dealers, employees, and other stakeholders. Some of my fellow dealers, many of whom I consider friends, received notices this past few weeks that they will, they will not be part of the new GM. While I cannot advocate the termination of any individual dealership, I will tell you that the, that the dealer council will work vigorously with senior GM management over the past two and a half years to address circumstances that we dealers face today. During my tender as chairman, all meetings between the NDC and GM management have and will continue to be led with dealer profitability as the primary goal of our dealer network. That is because dealer profitability and the reinvestment it makes possible are the keys to improving our customer experience at our dealership. And improving that experience is essentially essential to our ability to compete against our best competitors. I also can tell you that regarding the restructuring of GM dealer, the GM dealer network to improve its competitive, competitiveness, GM has elected to wind down affected dealers over a 17th month period, allowing them to make an orderly business planning decision about their futures. In addition, GM has, G, GM has recognized the need. It's just going to buzz. Let's go ahead. Keep okay. going. Okay. GM has the recognized. Uh, has recognized the need to offer certain compensation to dealers winding down their operations, something Chrysler clearly chose not to do. Before I conclude, I should tell you that the vast majority of GM dealers I know are, are also overwhelmingly optimistic about GM's future. They believe that the uncompromising quality, reliability, and dependability of our current portfolio of vehicles. I can tell you that in my 26 years at Paddock Chevrolet, I have never had a better portfolio of vehicles to sell. The stunning designs and compelling fuel, and fuel economy improvements of these vehicles gives us hope for the future. In closing, let me say I appreciate your time, and more importantly, understand, understand, more, and more importantly, your understanding of the significant impact a successful General Motors will have on this great nation. My family has been a part of GM for decades. My father as a GM dealer, my two uncles who were UAW members working at the Tonawanda engine plant since the day I was born. Everything my, fa my family had come from their association with GM, from the food on my table to the 1982 Camaro I proudly drove to my high school graduation. Paddock Chevrolet and all GM dealers are and will continue to be a vital part of the future success of the new GM. I, like my father before me, will continue to work tirelessly to ensure that a vibrant GM dealership can be proudly passed on to my children and will continue to be a fixture in the Buffalo community. Thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kikanap, can we get, get your testimony in? Uh, we have one vote, and w let members know I plan on getting through this uh, testimony of, of this witness, and we'll take a 15-minute break and get right back. and. And, and finish up this hearing. It's the only vote we'll have today, so we'll get it on. Mr. Kikanap, if Kim, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is Daniel J. Kikanap, and I'm the general manager and a shareholder of Tacoma Dodge, an automobile dealership in Tacoma, Washington. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell you the Tacoma Dodge story and how the TARP funds you authorized are being used. Tacoma Dodge has been in business continuously since 1972. Until this week, the dealership was valued at several million dollars and employed 71 people. In the month of April 2009, the last month for which we have a complete report, reports prepared by Chrysler showed that Tacoma Dodge was ranked number one in western Washington and number two in the entire state of Washington for the sale of new Dodge vehicles. These reports prepared by Chrysler also showed that out of eight western states covered by the reports, Tacoma Dodge ranked 32 out of 313 dealers for the sale of Dodge vehicles. Other reports prepared by Chrysler for the area Chrysler termed Team Washington, which covers more than the state of Washington, shows that in 2006, Tacoma Dodge was ranked seventh out of 60 dealerships. In 2007, it was ranked eighth out of 41 dealerships. And in 2008, our worst year ever, because of the economy and the public's lack of enthusiasm for Dodge vehicles, we still ranked eighth 
out of 35 dealership at, at 35 dealerships. These stellar sales rankings were accomplished in competition with other dealers selling multiple lines of Chrysler vehicles, whereas Tacoma Dodge only had the opportunity to sell Dodge brand vehicles. The dealer performance report prepared by Chrysler for year end 2008 comparing Tacoma Dodge with the Dodge dealers in Washington State shows we have net earnings of $1,704,000 $249, whereas the group average for the same period was $680. Yes, only $680 average per dealership. We enjoyed the same success with our parts business. The dealer scorecard for December 2008, a report prepared by Chrysler, shows that in 2008 Tacoma Dodge purchased $3,895,166 worth of new parts from Chrysler whereas the average dealer within the United States purchased a total of only $746,107 worth of parts. Chrysler designates its top 100 dealers for the sales of parts as Mopar Masters dealers. We were one of these top 100. In fact, we ranked number 76 among, among all of the Chrysler dealers in the United States for the sale of parts. In the area of customer satisfaction and retention, we consistently outperformed our peers. As of February 2009, Tacoma Dodge had an over 25% customer retention average as compared to approximately 17% average for all of the Chrysler dealers in the Western United States. Our problems began when Chrysler assigned us an unreasonably high minimum sales requirement, requiring us to sell an unrealistically high number of vehicles. We didn't understand why Chrysler would assign us such an unreasonably high number so we looked at the demographics they used and found that they had made several errors in the traffic patterns and other demographics they used for our market area. We then pointed this out to Chrysler and asked them to recompute our minimum sales requirement based upon the correct demographical information. Unfortunately, Chrysler refused to even consider our request. In the spring of 2008, I attended the only dealer meeting I am aware of whereby representatives of Chrysler explained Project Genesis to the Chrysler dealers in Western Washington. Project Genesis is the name of their program to reduce the number of dealers. During that meeting, representatives of Chrysler stated that under Project Genesis, there would be two Chrysler dealerships in Pierce County, Washington, and one of those dealerships would be in the city of Tacoma, so that the needs of Chrysler customers in Tacoma would be adequately addressed. On May 14, 2009, I received notification from Chrysler that it intended to terminate Tacoma Dodge as a dealer. In the state of Washington, we have a Franchise Act to protect dealers from manufacturers unreasonably, unreasonably terminating a dealer. Under the Washington Franchise Act, Chrysler would never have been able to terminate Tacoma Dodge since Tacoma Dodge was one of its most outstanding dealers using any yardstick you want to use to measure our performance. However, the notification from Chrysler told us we were being terminated under the U.S. bankruptcy laws, which provide no such protection to dealers. The termination of Tacoma Dodge leaves the city of Tacoma which is the second largest city in Western Washington with a population of almost 200,000 without a single Chrysler dealership. Chrysler term Chrysler's termination of us also leaves Pierce County, which has a population of almost 800,000 persons and is the second most populous county in the state of Washington with only one Chrysler dealership. As a result of Chrysler's actions, Tacoma Dodge, which in April was ranked the number one de Dodge dealer in Western Washington, can no longer sell any new vehicles, nor can we do any warranty work on any new vehicles. We have been reduced to being a used car lot and a neighborhood automobile repair facility. In the process, 35 faithful and loyal long-term employees have lost their jobs, and Pierce County and the state of Washington have lost a payroll of approximately 1.3 million per year. Again, thank you for the opportunity you have given me to tell you how the TARP funds you authorized are being used. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. We have a vote on the floor. It's only one vote, so I'm going to ask members to let's recess right now, go down, vote. We'll come back. We'll hear from Mr. Spitzer and Mr. Golick, then we'll go right into questions. So please come back in 15 minutes. We're going to be in recess for about 15, 20 minutes, give you all a chance to stretch your legs, and uh, see you back here in about 15, 20 minutes. We're in recess. <coughs> I think it's
say anything publicly. My uh, wife's family uh, told Mr. Thomas is from uh, Klamath Falls. Oh, really? And uh, they they're there. The other ship too. That's what he just told me. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Walden is Mr. They were. Uh, in the lumber business, her my wife's family they owned uh, Ochico. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Last that's name cool. last yeah. name was Fable. If they did, yeah, yeah, the museum. Uh -huh. and yeah, uh, that's that's them. And, uh, uh, no, tell Mr. Thomas. It, uh, <laughs> hearing earlier this week on the government's role in the restructuring of General Motors and Chrysler. The witnesses are two Obama administration officials who are working with the auto companies. While the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee takes a break for House votes, we're going to show you a portion of a Senate hearing earlier this week on the government's role in the restructuring of General Motors and Chrysler. The witnesses are two Obama administration officials who are working with the auto companies. Uh, Treasury's proposed equity stakes in GM and Chrysler are giving people great pause, as you've heard already just in the two opening statements uh, that Senator Shelby...